morning, everyone. Uh, so I'm the one with the complicated slides, but I want you to realize that sometimes when the slides are really simple, that's when it's actually difficult and, and there are things to discuss. And when the slide looks really busy, you can actually get a headline out of it and say, there's one simple message here. So there's going to be a mixture of those slides that look deceptively simple. And I understand that the slides are available. Is that correct? So, you know, there's more information in there. So, you know, whether they're worth reading or not, I don't know, that's your, that's your um, uh, prerogative. Okay, so, moving forward. Um, I'm here talking about complications of, of CLL and therapy as well. Um, th when it comes to talking about the therapy, there's lots that's written in the slides. So, maybe if we're running short of time, that's something that we can we can read you know, uh, uh, afterwards rather than just rattling through lists of things because that's not what we're here for today. Complications, well, they can start sooner, they can start later. Things can happen at different times along the, uh, the career span of, of, of a CLL career. Um, they can be both physical and psychological, of course. They can be CLL related or they could be related to uh, the therapy itself. They could be related to the immune system, or they could be hematological problems such as uh, thrombocytopenia. They could be infective problems, or they could be the malignancy associated with Richter's transformation or secondary malignancies, for example. So that's just kind of a flavor of, of what I'm going to talk about just now. In terms of early complications, I really do see the majority of my patients at an early stage in the CLL. So our GPs are really very proactive. They'll take a blood test. They'll send the patient in to me. Um, and I'll sit down with the patient and I'll say, well, OK, I've looked through some of your blood results that you've had done last year or the year before or five years ago. And I'll say, well, you've got a bit of a lymphocytosis there in 2013. I think you probably had the same thing for a long time. It's just that you're here with me today. And now that can be a bit of a two-edged sword. You know, it can be alarming. Oh my God, I had something that was undiagnosed and a new treatment. Um, or it could be reassuring that actually if you came to me this time last year, we'd have the same conversation. We'd be talking about the same thing, which is you're okay. We're going to watch this for a period of time. So maybe there's something in that that you know, is, is worth exploring with people. It doesn't work with everyone, that's for sure. Um, of course, this is a, 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 a personal challenge for people. There is no such thing as a good leukemia, as, as one of Chris Fagan's messages has been very profound and profoundly expressed on that. When you have a diagnosis of CLL, this is an entire challenge to your sense of identity and well-being as a human being. Uh, and that's no different from any other cancer. In fact, it can be worse with this because there is no immediate answer, reason, or treatment. Whereas when somebody comes to us with an acute leukemia, as Anna was saying, this is, you know, it's, it's, all, it, it's, it's all happening in one go. You've got this, we're gonna do that. And it can be more straightforward in those circumstances. So there's, there's more of a, a sense of building a relationship with people over a period of time. Now, this, this worry about the self, the future self, people around us, our friends and our family is a significant part of it. People search for information and it's the role of you guys and us to provide that information. Are we giving the right information out? Are we talking about the right things? You know, we need some guidance here. So, I'm looking for feedback through the audience, if I can. Okay. Um, and dealing with watch and wait, we've talked about that. So watching and waiting is a tension. It's a tension between that living normally and trying to just get on with things and be, be normal, go to the movies, have a nice meal out, whatever it might be, and remaining vigilant and aware of yourself and aware of your health without losing the, the sense of freedom that we, we, you know, we, we enjoy and something that we search for and gives us quality of life. So is it possible to ever to relax that endless vigil without the fear of losing the opportunity for treatment? So if you let your guard down and let things go, do you then leave it too long? 
Okay. Is that a worry for people? And of course, treatment gradually becomes more appropriate as we go through this, this gray zone of, well, you're okay now, come back in six months, or whatever it might be, and you're less okay, but you're still okay. Come back in another six months' time. You know, what impact does that have? Well, your hemoglobin is 112, and your platelet count's 126. Hey, these are normal, but are you well? Yeah, I'm okay, a bit tired. I'm not ready to treat you yet. Okay. So that gray zone carries on. And the treatment, the time of treatment, is therefore very rarely a pivotal moment. It's not coming in through the accident and emergency department, the emergency department with a five-day history of shivers, temperatures, nosebleeds, and being ill, and suddenly decompensating totally. Last week, I was playing five-a-side football. This week, look at me. Okay, it doesn't happen like that in CLR. So there's rarely that pivotal moment. So we've got to live with this prolonged um, jet lag of, of anticipating treatment. What about other things to look out for? Okay, so we mentioned autoimmune hemolytic anemia already. So this is where you have an antibody being produced against the red blood cells. It sits on the red cells. The body is fooled into thinking that those red blood cells are abnormal in some way, and they are taken out of the circulation, usually in the spleen. And you can make people profoundly anemic over a very short period of time. You could also have the same process with platelets, causing a very low platelet count and a risk of bruising and bleeding, and rarely things like red cell aplasia, where you take the red cells out almost before they're born in the bone marrow. Another thing we're going to talk about is hypogamma globulinemia, which is, I think, one of the key problems in people with CLL, either untreated or treated. And this leads to recurrent infections, and it can lead to structural lung disease, damage to the lung tissue, such as bronchiectasis. We'll have a look through that. So symptoms of anemia, tiredness, lethargy, running out of steam. So you can start off okay, but you very quickly find that your muscles ache, you're tired, you can't, you can't do what you're doing, whether it's vacuum cleaning or washing up or lifting the shopping, going to work, working at the computer, whatever it might be. And it might manifest as angina pain if you have ischemic heart disease, palpitations perhaps, the heart rate's got to go up to keep going with the flow of oxygen. Someone might look pale, and because the red cells are being broken down, this releases bilirubin, which is the biochemical constituent of jaundice. Lots of other causes of jaundice, but essentially the bilirubin is what gets into the skin and the eyes. You can have this yellow tinge in the eyes. And we sometimes see bluish cells in the blood film. So you can see in, the, in some of these that the cells look a little bit more blue. They should be red cells. Well, the blue cells are the very early cells that get produced by the bone marrow, if it's capable of producing them. And I find that with some of my, my patients, you know, if they've had severe bone marrow failure, that they, that they can't produce and, uh, and, and, and restore their red blood cell count because the bone marrow is already compromised. But mostly, if it's early on, they can do. There's a few studies. This is, this is worth looking at. So population studies. What are the statistics around autoimmune hemolytic anemia? Okay, this study goes back a few years, and you'll see at the bottom that it talks about chlorambucil treatment. But the main point is that most of these people have active CLL. This is a study of 1,200 people, so over 1,000 people with CLL, and they found that 52 of them, less than 5%, had autoimmune hemolytic anemia. And that's probably just about representative, well, of maybe 5%, maybe a bit more um, according to experience. Mostly the lymphocyte count is up. And some of them actually present with hemolytic anemia. So their presenting feature is anemia, and then we find that they've got CLR. But most of them don't. They present it later on, maybe around a median of three years, so 36 uh, months into their treatment. And most people spot, respond to steroids. So we give steroids, but we can also do other things. We can take out the spleen, we can give rituximab. There's a few things we can do. But actually, steroid works very well for most people. There's another study, and this shows immunoglobulin IGHV status. Okay, so it was really fascinating. What about H IVHG status in, in, um, uh, uh, in, in hemolytic anemia? And I think this probably reflects the fact that 
people with autoimmune hemolysis have more active disease and therefore perhaps it's selecting for the uh, unmutated group rather than anything else. Whether there's anything more immunological than that, well, that's slightly beyond me. More cleverer people will know this. Uh, so here we go. This is the immune system in CLL. This is absolutely essential. You've got your V-shaped IgG molecule with the purple bits showing the, the fingerprint end, that complementarity determining region right at the end that's very specific for whatever bacteria or virus or whatever it might be that the immunoglobulin is, is, a, is, uh, is there to attack. Now, as time goes by with CLL, there is this insidious reduction in the immunoglobulin level. And most people with CLL will eventually experience some form of serious infection. So this is a major problem in CLL, infection and susceptibility to infection. And the risk increases over time with this gradually falling immune system. CD4 counts might drop because of therapy, but the immunoglobulin levels will almost certainly fall slowly over years um, by themselves before, well, um, without the help of any treatment, with often a stepwise reduction in immunity following treatment. So the immunoglobulin levels may drop <clears throat> excuse me, um, dramatically after, let's say, FCR or rituximab-based treatment, for example. And neutropenia is, is likely to be an effect of therapy rather, rather than CLL. We don't see that very often with CLL as, as pure neutropenia. And if you're going to have hypogamma globulinemia, then there's going to be a range of infections. Now, these are mostly bacterial infections. Um, we do see um, viral infections commonly in CLL as well, so seasonal flu, for example. And normal viral infections can sometimes be really devastating. Um, herpes simplex virus, varicella zoster, the chicken pox virus, CMV uh, reactivation, and occasionally fungal infections in pneumocystis urovecci uh, that comes up. So these are, these are really unpleasant infections that, uh, that can strike our patients either through hypogamma globulinemia or through complications of therapy. So exacerbated by treatment and disease, particularly in the lungs, and this is where our patients get their main problems. Levels of immunoglobulin, normal in, in, in our lab is between six and 12 grams, and I often see these sort of grumbling, sinusy type things, ear type things, just a bit of a nose uh, drip, a bit of a dry cough, these sort of low-grade symptoms that people have with an immunoglobulin level between the sort of normal and what is considered to be seriously low in, in the UK, we have a cutoff around three grams. But between three and six, or even around normal, many of my patients have these low-grade grumbly symptoms, and I sometimes feel that I cannot do very much about it. And I think that there is an opportunity there to identify this, codify it, analyze it, see how common they are, and see how we can benefit people. Now, immunoglobulin replacement is extremely expensive, and there are gatekeepers. I'm not sure how it works in other countries, but in our country, in the UK, we have uh, national guidelines, guidance, and we have, this is bronchiectasis, so we don't want to see this, okay, damage the lungs, um, where the, the, uh, the airways are gradually destroyed, so they're widened, they're thickened, you can't clear the sputum, and you get secondary infection. So we have this national guidance in our immunoglobulin world where we submit our patient's details to a committee, and the committee decides whether or not they're going to be eligible for immunoglobulin. And it's actually quite difficult to, do, to, get, this, to get this drug sometimes. And anything that we can do to lower that threshold to make it easier to access treatments that improve immunity, then I would certainly be in favor of that. But that needs more information. It needs information gathering. Intravenous immunoglobulin, this comes as a pooled product. It's a blood product. Um, it doesn't come from UK donors uh, anymore because we've all got variant CJD, apparently. Um, and there's this demand management program to save money. Um, it's probably beneficial, NICE says, which, in my experience, it's certainly beneficial. 
but we have to give antibiotic prophylaxis and we have to make sure that the patient has had pneumococcal vaccine and then had a blood test to assess the response to the pneumococcal vaccine. Well, that makes sense anyway. And I would, and I would suggest that for all our patients that we have offered pneumococcal vaccination and assessed the response, the immunological response, which you can do by looking at the specific immunoglobulins four weeks after the vaccination. And that's one way of saying, my patient has now got protection against pneumococcus, but what I do find is that my patients, even with normal immunoglobulin levels, they don't always respond. So there is a risk that immunoglobulin level headlines are not always reflective of the immunity as such. So preventing infection, avoid chemo, okay? Avoid treatment, avoid steroids. So all these things that sometimes you just have to do and you can't avoid them. But there is one advantage of watching and waiting, that it helps prevent infection. We talked about vaccines. For goodness sake, don't smoke. Take some regular exercise and prophylactic antibiotics, which may help. I've written levofloxacin, but there are many others. And we often use azithromycin, clarithromycin, and combinations of, of other antibiotics. And immunoglobulin, we've talked about. So what about diaries and you know, keeping a watch on some of these symptoms? Certainly, I need to know, has my patient had a course of antibiotics so that I can document that and, and, uh, and see and use that in evidence for those committees. So that's, that's absolutely essential. And what about baseline investigations for lung disease? Should we be looking at more pulmonary function tests and, uh, and CT scans of our patients' lungs? Sometimes, I'm not talking about screening, I'm talking about a clinical need if there's a problem. Okay, so we're gonna go on to the therapy-related toxicities, and this is where we're gonna get some of those busy slides with long lists that we're not going to go pour over in any great detail, okay? So you know what the players are here. These are the usual suspects of combination chemotherapies and the newer agents. So chemotherapy, there's gonna be lots of guidelines on this. There should be local information. Does that local information stand up to scrutiny? Are you happy with that? Have you seen it? Does it, does it cover the bases as far as you guys are concerned? Okay, so here's a busy slide with a really simple message. The more intensive the chemotherapy, the higher the risk of infection. So that's, that's not a difficult message. Don't even look at the numbers, you can read them later. Uh, so roughly 10%, roughly 20%, and roughly 50% as you scale up the intensity of therapy. So that's chlorambosyl-based, bendamustine-based, and fludarabine, cyclophosphamide, rituximab. Those are the risks of a serious infection that lands you in hospital. Here's a, here's a long list. So, ibrutinib toxicities, people commonly get bruising and bleeding. That's a very common problem, but it's not necessarily a problem for most people. And severe bleeding is actually very rare. Um, I've, I've had one of my um, patients had AF on, uh, um, on ibrutinib, and that's one out of 29, I think we have, but um, so not quite 10%. Uh, I've not seen tumor lysis syndrome with, um, uh, with ibrutinib. And in the studies, they, although they did find tumor lysis syndrome, this was people who had, uh, they had it after they stopped. So this is resonating second line, third line treatment. So I'm not going to go through that long list. Again, here is another complex slide, essentially showing in green that these symptoms are relatively mild. And one of the take-home messages for ibrutinib is that most of the symptoms are relatively mild, but there is a wide range of problems that people can have. And another one where the simple take-home message is, if you're gonna have side effects, they tend to occur relatively early and then slowly peter out as time goes by. So it's unlikely that if you had something early on that it's going to carry on for longer, it may settle, but you're less likely to have problems later. So just to illustrate that. Sorry. And to compare ibrutinib with chlorambucil, 
you know, we talked about um, you know, all, all the, the side effects of ibrutinib. Look at chlorambucil as well. You've got a slightly different profile. Um, it's no better, no worse in some ways. Okay? So ibrutinib doesn't appear to be any worse than chlorambucil. You get different side effects with chlorambucil. Um, again, so early uh, ibrutinib, uh, the side effects are mild and unlikely to be uh, sign have significant impact, except in those people who they do. Um, so atrial fibrillation, major hemorrhage is going to be rare, but it can happen. Idella, there's been a lot of talk this year about Idella lisib and the side effects of Idella lisib. Generally, uh, these are early or late, and severe and mild, just like any other drug or drug combination. Um, the diarrhea that can occur early on is often self-limiting, but roughly six or eight months into treatment is the higher risk of more severe colitis, and colitis related to Idella is a severe problem, but it can be managed with steroids. So budesonide seems to be the treatment of choice currently for the severe colitis related problems of uh, Idella. You can have abnormal liver function tests, which are usually self-limiting, and you can often start the Idella again if there's a, if there's a minor problem with uh, some liver function tests. And this is a picture of pneumonitis, so an inflammatory change across the lung fields, and this causes severe shortness of breath. And again, it can have a slightly insidious onset while you're looking for uh, you know, a minor upper respiratory tract viral infection. So if you're not actively looking for it, you might miss this. And it's something that is going to occur usually between those clinic visits uh, and, and, uh, and patients will report cough, increasing shortness of breath, and they may have some fevers. Um, we're not sure why this happens, but this is a severe problem. Okay, stop the idella, treat with steroids, usually supportive measures. Um, we also know more about uh, preventing pneumocystis urovecci inf infections with Idella, and we know more about monitoring for CMV infections in Idella. So this is worth reading. This is a, this is a publication which came out last year, um, Steve Coutre, and some really very nice colorful information from Abvi on venetoclax. Um, the take-home message on venetoclax is that, well, not take-home message, but one of the major side effects, tumor lysis syndrome. And if we're going to be using venetoclax, then please check that has your hospital got an adequate response to the risk of tumor lysis syndrome? Is this something that's been considered significantly? What are the policies and procedures in place to guard against this, to monitor and to treat? Richter's transformation, this is a really nice slide which I stole from up to date. And you can see uh, the progression across the slide from these small cells, these are going to be the CLL cells, the ones you've seen in the blood films <clears throat> on a few occasions. And on the other side of the slide, these large cells which may be 10 times the size. So the cells change, they grow in size, they become aggressive, they turn over much faster. And Richter's transformation is something that can uh, really be a, a dramatic change in, in our patients' uh, well-being and sense of health. <clears throat> it may involve one lymph node area, it may involve multiple lymph node areas, but people often become rapidly extremely ill with it. And although Maurice Richter did not describe diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, because that's a, a more modern construct in histology, he described this change from small cells to an aggressive uh, form. And incidence seems to be a bit variable, up to 15%, but I think clinical experience is maybe a little bit less than that. Um, and it tends to occur within a few years of diagnosis, and this is a, has a very, very poor outcome. We don't really understand the risk factors, but there may be some genetic risk factors that uh, could be involved. If you do a PET scan on people with CLL, these PET scans, positron emission tomography, you give an injection of radioactive glucose, and it gets taken up by metabolically active areas in the body. So for example, the brain, the heart, the liver, for example, these are all going to be relatively metabolically active and will take up glucose. And the radioactivity can then be pinpointed, overlaid on a CT scan, and you can see where that is. In CLL, 
those lymph nodes that we have in CLR, they're often very quiet. And we don't see much glucose uptake in, in, on a PET scan. In the event of a rictus transformation, however, that metabolic activity will increase several fold and we may well see increased activity on a PET scan. So a PET scan could potentially be a good investigation for someone with increasing symptoms, sweats, fevers, weight loss, new lymph nodes, and could pinpoint an area that would require a biopsy. We've overrun, so shall I just stop? No, okay. Um, so this is my last slide, that's handy. So we must promote well-being and reinforce, reinforce the identity, encourage those vaccinations, encourage looking out for uh, infection. What about those diaries? Do we need to do that? Um, Self-checking and, you know, what about drug interactions as well? Is there enough information out there? I think the, 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 the business of CYP34A and drug interactions, well, you can't have grapefruit, you can't have this, and you can't have that. I think that information, the quality of that information can be improved, and, and, and that's something that you know, is worth considering as well. And I think that was my last slide. Thank you. Ben.